there are some Gospels that are rich, particularly in memories and associations. The Gospel of the Centurion often comes in the context of anointing the sick, and therefore one can but have in mind the various moments, the various situations, the various sick beds, dying beds, where one has actually used these words. Priests have this experience in common, that when one gives this sacrament of the sick, it has an effect of soothing, but can also have an effect of healing and bringing back, so that sometimes when one is going to anoint a person who seems on the brink and on the way out, they come back and they gain health and strength again, at least for a time. It is a sacrament which has come down to us from the Lord himself, and the Apostle James gives indications as to how it should be done. If anyone is sick among you, let him call on the elders of the church, elders, presbyteroi, which gives us the word presbyters, priests, the same word. They are to be called in and lay hands upon him, and of course there is also the promise of forgiveness of sins therein. The Eastern tradition would have taken seriously the notion of having not one priest but three. With regard to the West, we have always had just the one, but it is important and no layman can take his place. Hence it is that this ministry must not be replaced by sending lay people to do what is priestly. Accompanying the sick and the dying is directly sacerdotal. And it is not right the priest should be behind a desk or behind a computer while lay people are next to the dying when it, she should be there and no one else. Not even a deacon can do certain things. And we have, as it happens in the same gospel, a word which has come down in another sacrament, that that we are celebrating right now. And it has been restored in English since the more correct translation which has been re-established when the fullness of the original Greek comes through. Lord, I am not worthy to have you under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Well, my soul, rather than my servant. Here we have, therefore, an ancient word which has been embedded in our liturgy for time immemorial, and it is very powerful when said with the heart, gazing on the sacred host. In the renewal, it has been streamlined, and deliberately so. Until the changes in 1969, it was said three times by the priest, and then another three times by priest and people, so six times altogether. Here we are now invited, as in all the liturgical venue, to say once, but from the heart, quietly and well, slowly and thoughtfully, that is the whole thrust of renewal, and if more of the same thing carries on, e.g. high-speed celebrations even in the vernacular, we've missed the point, and how much of that is going on. And so, this is just an indication of the way in which scripture embeds itself spontaneously in the liturgy, and that is to be found throughout. Indeed, we have in the first reading the intertwining of scripture and tradition insofar as what becomes scripture, this first letter to the Corinthians, is containing tradition. It's all on there and being handed on, but from whom? From the Lord. For I received from the Lord, it says the apostle, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, again liturgical echoes, took bread when he had given thanks, it gives us the word Eucharist, having given thanks, having Eucharistified, having said thank you. Eucharist is well grace, and grace, of course, is the root of thanks. Gracias. Grazie in Italian. He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Now we have two traditions in the scriptures with regard to the institution. One which we have here, common to Luke and Paul, and the other in two of the synoptics, Matthew and Mark. 
they have their own line. The absence of any words of institution in the account of the Last Supper in St John is an interesting and puzzling phenomenon which can also find an echo in the redounding silence of one of the most ancient Eucharistic prayers, an aphore, that of Adai and Mari, which is used in the Syro-Malabar Syro rite to this day. There, until very recently, it was never written. Well, the same principle is at work, the principle of the Arcanum. Things were so sacred that they were only handed on orally, but they were known. Therefore, St. John had no need to put it down. He is the very first generation, and he is transmitting what he saw and what he has taught those who have been influenced by him. He was a bishop and would have been ordaining. So, it's handed on. And, as it happens, in the Western Rite, we have in all the families of the Western Rite, including the Celtic Church way back in Sarum in England, we have the ancient Roman canon, which is coming from Rome, but which is of Semitic origin. One can tell from the language used, Hebrew names coming in, Hebrew gestures, and above all, the use of this expression, hunc pretarum calicem, this precious chalice, which is an indication that they are using, at the point that this Eucharistic prayer is taking form, the very chalice of the Last Supper. So St. Peter is handling the same chalice in the initial celebrations. That shows the antiquity of it. The raising of the eyes to heaven shows again how we are going right back to the gestures used by the Lord and therefore by those who imitated him, Peter and the Apostles. So the Western Rite has one of the most ancient canons, and it is certainly of apostolic origin. It changed very little over the centuries, slightly expanded in the early centuries by the complementary nature of the second memento. One is completing the other and balancing it out. And also by the eventual addition of the seven holy women, martyrs, which are often linked with Rome, showing its link with Rome, where, of course, Peter came with the tradition from Jerusalem. So, here we have what has been handed on. But the interesting thing is that in the Western Rite, we have in the Eucharistic prayer, in the very words of consecration, a version which is not in Scripture. It's the fact that we have in all the families and all generations Novi et eterni testamenti, of the new and eternal covenant. Now, in the implementation of the reform, immediately after the Second Vatican Council, there was a question of amplifying, of varying the consecration, the formula of institution, according to the new Eucharistic prayers coming in. But it was one of the cases in which the supreme authority of the Pope himself came in and stopped it. He, Blessed Paul VI, foresaw that this was going to create a distraction for celebrants and he obliged them not to change anything in the actual formula. Things change around it, but the actual formula doesn't change. It's the same in all. There's a slight exception in a recent stage. It's that of the Eucharistic prayer for children. There we have one word coming in, and then he said to them, do this in memory of me. But essentially it's not this, no, not different, it's that it's made slightly more evident for children. All that to say that this is to be found in the fact that we are handling there an orally transmitted formula of institution and consecration, therefore showing its antiquity. If it's in a very venerable oral tradition from apostolic times, it means that it's a form handed down from the beginning. Interesting. This then is what we have, and over which we have no power. And to come to liturgy wanting to use it as though it were a Protestant prayer meeting in which we're in charge and do any ad-libbing we want to, is to show that we are suffering from the original sin of the demon, pride, using the most sacred of all to glorify ourselves. O oh Lord, how great I am. Come up the hills,
Spend it, spend it on the earth. As the light of light descended from the realms of endless day, that the powers of hell may vanish as the darkness clears away. At his feet the sing swing its sail of cherubim with sleepless eyes. Veil their faces to the presence, as with ceaseless voice they cry, Alleluia, Alleluia.